This is the Xiaomi 13 Ultra. It has the most sophisticated, most ludicrously specced out camera system on any phone ever. So I thought, does it beat the most popular flagship phone on the planet? The iPhone. I mean, it definitely wins a point in the unboxing department. Not even because this is some sort of extraordinary presentation, but because at least it does come with everything you need. You get an insert onto off, which has the SIM ejector, a couple of manuals, and a hard case. This is kind of a weird shape. And then right at the very bottom, a 90 watt charger, which is surprisingly compact for what's still quite a high wattage. The USB-C cable, and then of course the 13 Ultra itself. The iPhone packaging, as you know, is nice. It's satisfying, but basic. There's no charger here and definitely no case. It's not even really a competition. And honestly, the differences only get bigger when you start looking at the design of these phones. The iPhone is much less polarizing. It kinda has to be. If Apple wants this to be the phone that 30 million people are gonna buy, they've got no room to be edgy wow. with any of the style choices. They've got to keep it simple, clean, elegant. And this does that. Xiaomi doesn't have that same concern. I think this company knows full well that they won't be selling 30 million units of these. They're going to sell two, maybe three million. And those three million are going to be pro users who are actively seeking something that feels unique. And this achieves that goal. I wouldn't say it's the neatest, prettiest phone. It's got like a speed bump halfway up the back of it. The sides of the phone blend into the rear, which is again, just a bit weird. And it kind of makes this strip going up the back look like a carpet that's not fitted properly. The phone rattles quite a bit thanks to lots of large camera lenses moving around and the screen borders are still not completely even all the way around, which at this point is just bordering on painful. But technically, it's really impressive. The only reason that you can even see the sides blending into the back is that the sides and the back are actually all one continuous piece here, which, you know, I've had a pretty good play at trying to bend or creak or crack and uh, nothing. <laughs> By using a unibody design like this, they've massively reduced the number of points of vulnerability around the phone. It reminds me of how reassuring the unibody MacBook feels, it, like how resistant it is to any kind of flexing, compared to a lot of these even technically more expensive laptops that just are made of more parts. Well, that did not sound good. And then this uh, rug on top is actually specially treated silicone, which is made for grip, is completely resistant to smudges and fingerprints, made to be anti-yellowing, which is not a given for silicone finishes, and even inhibits the growth of 99% of bacteria. Plus, I know I bang on about this, but having your camera in the middle of your phone's body is actually just really helpful, because it means that when you put it on a table, it's quite usable without wobble. So effectively, I think the iPhone is a little more form, I think the Xiaomi is a little more function. Both matter, but I just think it's up to you in this case on which one matters more. But then you notice something on the Xiaomi that is just undeniably peak smartphone, the screen. Because putting aside for a minute my nitpicky gripes about the bottom chin being thicker, or the top corners looking a little bit off just because of the way the screen slopes around the edges, the actual panel itself is dazzling. You might have heard of a few phones in the last few years cropping up with 1500 nit peak brightness levels. The iPhone's actually well regarded for going even beyond that at 2000 nits. And now this pushes that all the way to 2600. That's so high that it's a difference you don't even notice in most scenarios. But it means that should you be in direct sunlight, this phone is not just visible from all angles, but actually bright from all angles. Plus, the fact that it is slightly curved at the sides is, I think, a perk too. It feels a little bit rough when you have the pre-installed screen protector on, because your thumb is effectively grazing over the edge of it, but so long as you possess the risk appetite to take it off, it makes gestures feel way more fluid than they do on the sharp edges of the iPhone. And the crown jewel is that while both phones have super fast 120Hz refresh rates, the Xiaomi's using more up-to-date refresh rate tech that can scale the refresh rate up and down faster and more battery efficiently than the iPhone can. It is also the higher resolution screen, but I just hesitate to call that a benefit. Because it's one of those strange situations where they're giving you the option to use the screen in super high res mode, but then subtly telling you that they don't actually recommend it for the majority of users for battery reasons. Because by default, the phone actually runs at 1080p, which is lower than the resolution on the iPhone. But okay, so given that Xiaomi takes this super energy saving ideology and the fact that you've got this super energy efficient panel, how good actually is the 13 Ultra's battery? So I've got a new version of both phones. I've charged them up to 100%. We'll unplug and I'll spare you the pain of actually having to watch smartphones die one percentage point at a time. <laughs> Let's just fast forward all the way to the moment where the Xiaomi 
calls it quits. Because sure enough, yes, even though it has a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, which is quite significantly bigger than Apple's 4,300 one, even with the lower resolution and the more advanced screen technology, it is still the first one to go. It ends up with 10 hours and 8 minutes in this particular run, and the iPhone only very marginally longer at 10 hours 18. As for where that puts these phones in real world usage, I've been using a 14 Pro Max every single day since launch, and I would say it's one of those phones with good battery life, but not so good that you can just completely forget about it. And Xiaomi sits in that same ballpark. But what makes me actually slightly prefer it is the new hibernation mode. See, plot twist, the Xiaomi's not actually dead. It's programmed to hibernate when it hits one percentage point of battery. It closes all apps, it disables almost everything to give you one more solid hour of still being reachable. So overall, we'll call battery a draw, but that's a cool feature. Can we just have every phone do that from now on? And if you're curious how long each one then takes to charge up, well, I plugged both back in. I went down to make myself a nice tea, and by the time I was back, which was probably four minutes later, Xiaomi was already at 15%. It's not hugely surprising. I mean, 90 watt charging is significantly more powerful than Apple's 27 watts. But it is kind of interesting that even though this is Xiaomi's highest end smartphone ever, it's far from their fastest charging phone. You can get Xiaomi phones with over 200 watts of charging power nowadays that charge in like nine minutes. But I guess because super fast charging comes with its own set of compromises, like usually having a smaller battery capacity, and that their marketing for this one is almost definitely going to focus on the cameras, they decided to keep the charging a little bit more. Typical. Which is not to say slow, because it's still fully charged within 45 minutes, while the iPhone is lingering at 66%. Xiaomi is way ahead of Apple, but uh, we're not yet. I think it would be absolutely hilarious if me and my tiny team of seven people could actually overtake the single largest tech company on the entire platform. And hey, if we do, I will personally build the largest, most powerful powerful iPhone on the planet myself. So a sub to the channel would be me, Teoric. <laughs> so that's five points to so two points right now. But what about the audio quality? I actually have a very exciting new microphone that we're gonna be able to test this with. So for a moment, try to imagine that these are your ears. This is what the iPhone sounds like. It's very clean sound with a little kick of bass, but it's not one of those phones at the same time that like defies its dimensions in audio or anything. So now let's switch over to the Xiaomi. And this phone does something a little differently. Instead of one downward firing speaker and then the earpiece on the front doubling as the second, this has one bottom firing and then one top firing. And I like the fact that Xiaomi gives you more symmetrical sound, but to be honest for me, the fact that Apple's earpiece fires directly towards you makes the vocals feel more direct. And it's also a little bit louder. So. I would go with the iPhone here. The software is subjective, of course, but I will say one thing. Xiaomi is not Xiaomi sh shying away from being clearly inspired by Apple. You know it's similar when you're finding that the muscle memory that you've developed with your iPhone still works to control this phone. Now that doesn't make it bad. I mean, on the contrary, this new MIUI 14 can let you open up more apps at once. Although who actually uses more than two on a phone? There's a wider selection of more colorful widgets. I I'm finding it better organized in terms of finding what you need from the settings. Plus this is the smoothest a Xiaomi phone has ever been in my eyes. And actually just before we get to the cameras, this is something that we do need to test. How fast is it? A few weeks ago, I compared the speed of the iPhone to a souped up gaming Android, which had an external cooler attached to it. But arguably the even more interesting question is, how does a more traditional Android flagship, one that's more focused on photography, stack up to Apple in performance? So I've run a whole suite of benchmarks and the results are pretty clear. The Apple is far ahead when it comes to the CPU performance, anywhere from 15 to 25%, depending on how you measure it. But the Xiaomi leads when it comes to the graphics. And just to see how well each phone handles temperature, because Xiaomi does go on about how this phone has the first aerospace grade, toroidal, vapor, liquid separated, powered cooling system. God, the marketing these days. Kill me now. I ran an extreme stress test for 20 minutes straight. And actually, yeah. You'll notice that Xiaomi not just starts at a higher score because its graphics are better, but also that this score falls slower over the course of the test. It has a higher stability of 80.8% as opposed to 65.8. Which basically means that whatever gobbledygook they've actually called this internal cooling system, it does work. When you push both phones to their limit, this does feel hotter on the outside, but that's because the cooling system is doing a better job of getting heat out the inside. And internal heat is generally where more of the problems occur, which makes overall performance about a draw, depending on what specifically you're trying to do on your phone. Time to see what this phone was made for. 
cameras. Because, I mean, you don't have to look at the specs for long to see that on paper, Xiaomi absolutely murders the iPhone. We're talking a 32 megapixel selfie camera, four 50 megapixel cameras on the rear, yes, four, with all four having high-end sensors and the main camera having the largest sensor currently available on a phone. This is why the crowd basically erupted when the price of this phone was announced. We've never seen a phone camera like this. But uh, before we get to the rear cameras, which to be honest, actually do deliver on that type, we need to talk about the front camera because it does not. It just looks so washed out. I actually look a bit like a ghost. And it's a far cry from what phones like the Google Pixel have done with their super deep natural skin tones. And while this is somewhat rescued by the powerful image processing when you're snapping photos, but honestly, the video is pretty trash. I mean, like, look at this room over here. It's just, it's just a white blob. Plus, it's limited to 1080p, which I just don't understand. Like genuinely, if there's anyone at Xiaomi watching this video, please tell me why this phone, your 2023 pinnacle flagship ultra phone, cannot record 4K on its front camera. It's not a tech limitation. Phones have been able to do this for years now. Surely it's not a cost concern. They've kitted out every single other camera on the phone all the way to 8K. And it can't be anything to do with the size of the cameras either because Samsung does 4K just fine with one that actually takes up less space. The only thing I can think is like, maybe people feel like 4K might overrepresent skin imperfections. But honestly, how your skin looks is much more down to the software processing than it is the resolution. You can have sharp footage that also makes you look good, like the Samsung that I'm recording this on. It might seem like a small nitpicky thing, but honestly, in an age where everyone is creating content using their smartphones, especially this front facing camera, I don't think it is. This front camera has probably been the single thing that has actually stopped me from jumping shit all the way from the iPhone, because I've been very tempted. And to understand why I've been so tempted, Let's talk about the rear cameras. And really the best way to showcase just how great these rear cameras are is not to blind you with a flurry of hundreds of shots taken from it. I mean, every flagship from the last five years has been able to take photos like this. It's showing you how easy it makes it to do that. The key thing that I would say Xiaomi have just mastered with this phone is the thoughtlessness. Everything about the way this camera system works. The fact that each individual lens is super high quality. And so you can zoom all the way in and all the way out without worrying about degradation. The fact that focusing is first class so you don't need to sit there messing with it or even tapping your screen to pick out your subject. The fact that the colors are really pleasing. I hesitate to say that the colors are accurate because to be honest, if you're going for raw accuracy, I still think the iPhone does do a better job. But for me personally, what the Xiaomi does do is better than that. I think if you point blank ask someone, would you rather your photos are realistic or not? The vast majority of people would say, I want realism. We don't like the idea that images are being tampered with. And I'm the same, I like the concept, but the truth is, Every smartphone is doing thousands of calculations and adjustments to each photo you take anyways. And when it actually comes down to it and you show someone what technical accuracy actually looks like, side by side with what the Xiaomi does, which I would say is stylistically prettier, I have a strong feeling that most people would rather actually have Xiaomi's photo. It delivers not necessarily exactly what your eyes see, but more what your eyes think a great photo should look like. And so, it makes you feel good. It makes you excited to use it, to see what other beautiful cinematic artsy shots you can take, while also, for one of the first times, matching the reliability of the more functional, tool-like iPhone camera. Now, it does also have a variable aperture on its main camera, which allows it to switch between a wide f1.9 and a really narrow f4.0. But I just think it's kind of dumb for this phone. I mean, the three main challenges that we spent the entire last decade trying to overcome with smartphone cameras are getting more light into these smaller sensors, shooting shots faster, and creating more background blur to mimic the cinematic style of professional cameras. Switching your aperture to f4.0 basically shuts off your light intake, shoots shots slower, and reduces background blur. I mean, there's a couple of super niche situations where you might want this, like long exposure photography, but come on, when your front camera looks like this, Fix that first! Anyways, where I was actually even more impressed by this phone was its night mode. Let's be very clear, the iPhone is good at night, but the Xiaomi 13 Ultra feels not like, eh, it's kind of close, could go either way, genuinely like there is no competition. Like this is a photo from both phones' main cameras. You can see so many little parts where the 13 Ultra is just picking up a little bit more information or is a little bit sharper. But where you notice the difference even more is flicking to the ultra wide cameras. Because Xiaomi is both wider while also being more detailed. I was expecting Xiaomi to also steamroll when it came to the zoom shots, since Apple's zoom camera is 
just not equipped for the dark, so it uses its main camera and just digital zooms in. I mean, to be fair, so long as there are lights around, the Xiaomi does tend to win. But it's just when you go to those super, super dark scenarios that Apple's artificial intelligence algorithm does seem to just creep out ahead a little bit, and Xiaomi freaks out. But the video really impressed me. I wouldn't go as far as to say that this has better video than the iPhone, but it's not really worse. The sharpness, the stability, the dynamic range. This feels like a big thing to say, but for all the time that I've used this, it hasn't felt like a compromised video experience, which is one of those things that I've just come to expect when using an Android phone. It's still a little bit grainier in super low light, but then on the other hand, you can film 8K video at five times magnification. Yeah, it's only 24 FPS, so it's a little jittery or cinematic, but that's not normal on a phone. So Xiaomi definitely wins in more categories than the iPhone. It doesn't outright mean it's a better phone for everyone. Like to me, the front camera is particularly important and I can't work with this. But it is enough for me to say that if you like the sound of it, I can very easily recommend it when it launches in your country. Okay, this will be cool actually. Try filming this on the zoom camera of the phone. So recently, I've gone into a bit of a rabbit hole when it comes to securing my accounts. I've been seeing how even YouTubers who followed all the recommended steps, they've still managed to get hacked. It's scary. And it's made me realize that there are entire forums out there on the dark web whose entire purpose is basically just for people to buy and sell user data. Your addresses, your passwords, and sometimes they don't even need your passwords. A hacker can just send you a link via email, and if you so much as click on that link, can download a file that gives them access to your session ID, which effectively just means they can start browsing the internet already logged in as if they were you. So using Surfshark VPN is not a one-click solution that instantly solves all internet security problems, but it does make it a lot harder for bad actors like this to mess with you. It serves as basically a middleman to receive your internet traffic and scramble it to keep you anonymous to whoever's hosting the network. Plus, it comes with a proper antivirus, a private ad-free internet search, and Surfshark Alert, which will let you know if your data has been compromised. It's a very simple, quite inexpensive way to strengthen your security. Using the code BOSS, it ends up as less than $3 a month, with an extra three months for free for unlimited accounts and a money-back guarantee.